This is a McKenzie Institute short pod for a hostile world. My name is Alan Bonner. When the War Measures Act was proclaimed during the October crisis of 1970, General Ron Sheridan was a base commander in eastern Canada. Human rights were suspended in Canada after the separatist group, the FLQ, kidnapped two people in Quebec. One was eventually killed. General Sheridan did his duty commanding a battalion during the crisis in that province. He also served his country overseas in Cairo and Washington. At home, he was once called in to quell a penitentiary riot, and later he headed Canada's counter-terrorism task force. I had the opportunity to travel across Canada with General Sheridan, visiting many military bases, where we trained senior officers to speak clearly about Cold War issues, such as cruise missiles and the purchase of nuclear submarines. As General Ron Sheridan tells us now, whatever the issue, whatever the mission, you need a plan. You are given uh, the task of solving a military problem on the ground. You look at the factors that affect you. What does affect you? The ground affects you. The weather affects you. The enemy certainly affects you. The state of your own resources affect you. All right, you take these very, and sundry other items, depending on what your, your, your project is. You take each of these factors and you analyze them and you say, all right, uh, under, uh, under this heading, what should I bear in mind? What must I consider under these factors? It's long, it's short, it's tall, it's this, it's that. You, uh, and you draw conclusions from this. You list what the items may be that are significant, and then you say to yourself, so what? And from that, you get a series of deductions. Therefore, I deduce, I deduce this, and I deduce that. So you've taken these a, the same, and you've taken these various factors, you've made deductions from these factors, now it's time for you to come to some conclusion. Now you mentioned so many things, the ground, the physical assets, the people, the aim. Let's say you're at a hospital, you're at an educational mm -hmm. institution, oh. you're at a factory. It, you do these appreciations, Alan, you do these appreciations daily through your life. You do it at an intersection. When you're driving a car, you're not aware of it, but you are constantly carrying out an appreciation. Can I make it before the light turns? Should I speed up? Should I move to the right-hand lane? Do I have to watch for this policeman coming up here? Et cetera, et cetera. You're doing all this and constantly coming up with a plan of action, but you're doing it, of course, unconsciously. Now, let's assume that the risk manager listening to us uh, got to work safely, got through yes. that intersection, yeah. but doesn't have your military training and background. What the sorts of things you would um, muse about with that person, you would blue sky with that person, uh, looking after that institution, the hospital, the school, the factory? Well, one of the things, this perhaps is off the topic, I'm not sure, but one of the things that struck me, particularly since I left the military, was um, what I perceived to be, both in government and in private enterprise, uh, at times, a lack of a logical approach. And again, if I may, at the risk of wringing the neck of this appreciation business, one of the things it teaches you to do is to work it out logically and to uh, be perhaps uh, less uh, tempted by the moment, less driven by the moment. You stop and you say, logically, where should I go? Logic, uh, uh, when you're faced with the problem, logic leads you to doing some sort of formalized evaluation of the situation. You've done also, thre is a threat analysis yeah. different? No, um, not, not really. A threat analysis is an end in itself. However, getting back to my situation that I gave you a few minutes ago about the appreciation, uh, and I mentioned to you one of the factors in a military appreciation, uh, a tactical military appreciation, is enemy. Well, the enemy is a threat assessment. And there you look at the whole nine yards. Who is he? How big is he? How big is he? Uh, where is he? What's he equipped with? What is his morale? What is his leadership? Who is in charge? What kind of men are these? How are they liable to react? If I do this, what will they do then? The enemy is a formidable part of any evaluation. The enemy substitute the threat. You evaluate the threat, and from that you gain 
some insightful ideas as to how you should tackle the problem. Do non-military people ignore the fact that they have real enemies? Uh, for perhaps, and, and partly because it is so difficult to determine specifically what you're talking about. As you know, in the military, for example, we spend a lot of effort uh, in terms of uh, uh, acquiring intelligence, both technical equipment, God, the skies they are full of what we use to acquire information. We also use hum human it, as it's called. Uh, we use people. But we spend a lot of time setting up a means by which we can get the kind of information that we think is essential in order to make uh, the right decision. Because chances are the enemy um, is not going to behave the way you would like him to behave. So you better have a good idea of how he can behave, what he's capable of behaving. You can only get that by doing a thorough study of uh, the threat. What should be in that plan? How to do what? Yeah. Uh, what, in fact, you, 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 I think, do in these things is you come up with a, a, a list of operating procedures. In the event this should occur, take the following steps. Bang, 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 bang. If this should occur, bang, 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 bang. So that in that moment of uh, crisis, when the adrenaline's really uh, flowing, and you've only got perhaps minutes to react properly, you're not dependent on your memory, you're not dependent on your imagination, you've got something concrete you can go to and say, put this in action, step uh, plan A, and you're bang, bang, bang down like that. So a military person or someone in the industry who's followed your type of planning should not be surprised if vehicles are needed people are required. Because you've already thought of all of that. In the tranquility of your office when nothing was going wrong, you had already analyzed that these are things that were going to be required. And where to get them? Exactly. And beforehand, of course, as part of your planning, you had made contact with that resource to ensure that, yes, he does have what you need, and yes, he will be prepared to play ball, and yes, this is what he needs uh, from you in order to do it. And, uh, all right, having laid that all on, now you have the plan. But it, it's not good enough to write the plan and put it on a shelf. I've done that too many times. Now, you've got to pull it out and you've got to practice it, because nothing drills it better into the minds of people than actually having the opportunity to practice their plan. On top of that, it's true in industry as it is in government. Personnel are changing ever so rapidly. So the new people have got to be practiced. So these, these uh, plans that you have devised must be given an opportunity to be tested. Now you do that because military uh, units, particularly I'm talking here now of the land force, I'm talking of infantry battalions, artillery regiments, armored regiments, that sort of thing, they have the, they have a couple of things going for them that most other organizations don't seem to have. One is they have a very clear-cut chain of command, which is well understood by everybody and goes from the very bottom up to the very top. There is almost no duplication in this. Uh, there is, as a result, there is no confusion or relatively little confusion. Secondly, what you've got is a disciplined body of people, men and women, as the case may be. You have a disciplined body. This you can't buy off a shelf in a store. You can't go into General Motors and buy a disciplined body. It's not there. It's not part of their culture, of their ethos. But you certainly have every right to expect it in a foreign military unit, and that's what you get. So you get a, an already functioning chain of command, and a body of disciplined uh, troops. Often in the crisis and disaster circumstances in which our clients are going to find themselves, 
they may be interacting with military people mm. because it's a flood, a mm. tornado, mm. a snowstorm. Right. What is your advice for a civilian who maybe had a neighbor once who was in uniform, but other than that knows very little about the ethos and culture and chain of command and, well, and regimental history? How do you deal with a military person? First off, I think you, you should start on the premise that that military organization that's working with you is as anxious as you are, is as committed as you are to getting a solution to the problem that you're jointly facing. Uh, there's no room, there's no time for uh, mistrust. There's no time for doubt. Um, and it's been my personal experience, I smile when you ask the question, because it's been my personal experience that myself and my men have oftentimes been more prepared to uh, embrace the civilian organization or organizations we're working with without restraint, wholeheartedly, rather than the reverse. They have a suspicion about us. Where it comes from, God only knows. It's buried away in the culture, I suppose, and certainly has something to do with the fact that uh, movies and films and television so misrepresent uh, the military ethos. Uh, but that's, uh, that's, another, uh, that's another day. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, um, that uh, if I were counseling a group of civil authorities about aid to civil power, I'd say to begin with, have faith in these fellows. They're out to do the best by you they possibly can. Isn't it important to get those command centers coordinated uh, pretty quickly? Absolutely. Police, fire, military? Absolutely. Nothing works so well as when you, you take each of these functions and sitting side by side is the military opposite number of his civilian counterpart. That's by far the best way of doing it. And uh, uh, our history in this regard is not particularly good. Um, my own personal experience, particularly in the intelligence side, was that there was a large measure of mistrust, well, between various police agencies. Uh, we had serious difficulties in some of what Canada's crisis because of the mistrust between the various levels of police. Then, when you move the military in, that's just another level that's got to be overcome. Um, We've got, to, we've got to learn to cooperate and work together better. And the best way to do that, again, if I may say, is first of all, I have a plan to get you together in the proper groupings. And secondly, to practice it. So people do get to realize, do get to meet, do get to understand that uh, this guy with his combat boots and his rather large uh, weapon is uh, not, in fact, a, a hazard to my society, but is there as an aid. You once told me over a general conversation that if a plane crashed in just the right location in North America, 17 different state, federal, and national agencies might claim responsibility for that event. Is the jurisdictional question oh. still so confused? Uh, the jurisdictional, no, it's not as confused, but there still is room for confusion. Um, it's, it's very important in that the government of the day designate the responsible authority. There is no room at the top for there to be any indecision. Is this problem that we're facing, is this uh, uh, health and welfare's problem? Is this Solicitor General's problem? Is this National Defense's problem? You've got to start off with, uh, with uh, that result. Um, and then, w even within that, of course, there is lots of room for confusion. However, men of good of goodwill working together can and do overcome these things. You've also looked at the uh, philosophical side of counterterrorism as opposed to the operational yeah. side. Uh, philosophically, how much of a threat is there in North America? Put it this way. Vul uh, as to vulnerability, there could be two, no two countries that are more vulnerable to terrorism or threats of terrorism than the United States and Canada, simply because it is the nature of their society. And the very things that make our societies the kind of societies we want to be part of are the very things that uh, make it more vulnerable to terrorism.
openness, porous borders. Exactly the whole the, the whole business and, and, and the freedom. Uh, and uh, let me say right now that the last thing that you want to do is to is to forego any of this freedom that you speak of or that I speak of because that in itself is simply playing into the hands of the terrorists. So you have got to learn to work around this. To say nothing, of course, of, of the physical side of it all. Our countries are so large, so vast. Uh, we are so dependent on the power grids, the communication grids. All these things are very vulnerable uh, uh, to terrorist acts. So I would suggest to you that through a combination of things, North America is the target, the terrorist target uh, in uh, today's times. That was General Ron Sheridan, a career military officer who has had to deal with civil unrest, a penitentiary uprising, and terrorism. Any views expressed here are not necessarily those of the McKenzie Institute, its speakers, sponsors, or supporters. But the Institute is dedicated to fostering public discussion, debate, and education about security. Google the McKenzie Institute to join the discussion. The McKenzie Institute is grateful to its sponsors and supporters. Some of our short pods and video long talks are a result of the support of Heathbridge Capital Management Limited, the National Post, and Dundurn Publishing. My name is Alan Bonner.